Section 5.6, rational functions. So we have two toolkit functions that are rational functions. We have the reciprocal, the 1 over x function, f of x equals 1 over x. And we have f of x equals 1 over x squared, that is our reciprocal squared function. And there are a few characteristics that are distinct about rational functions we're going to discuss. The first of which is vertical asymptotes. A vertical asymptote is a vertical line on a graph that a function is undefined at. Okay? It gen specifically, it is where the function goes to plus or minus infinity as you approach that point. So on the reciprocal function, as the x values, as the inputs, approach zero, f of x goes to infinity. And similarly, as the x values approach from the left side of zero, they approach, the y values, the outputs, approach negative infinity. So we have a vertical asymptote, and we generally draw a dashed line to indicate that the function does not attain that value and that something interesting is happening there. Okay, so vertical asymptote x equals 0. We see something similar happening with the reciprocal squared function. Okay, our x values, as they approach 0, our outputs are approaching infinity from both directions. All right, so our vertical asymptote here is x equals 0. The next notable characteristic is the horizontal asymptote. A horizontal asymptote of a graph is a horizontal line, y equals b, where the graph approaches that line as the inputs increase or decrease. Okay, that is set in arrow notation right here. As x goes to infinity, the out, as the inputs go to infinity, the outputs approach some value b, or as the inputs approach negative infinity, the outputs approach some value b. So for both of these functions, I'm going to do this in a different color. For both of these functions, as the inputs and outputs increase, they are approaching the line y equals 0. As the inputs increase, the outputs are approaching 0 for both of these functions. Now, when we perform transformations on rational functions, what changes, essentially, is those asymptotes. So we want to keep that in mind. All right, use arrow notation to describe the end behavior and local behavior of this function shown. All right, well, the places where things are going awry are at x, as x approaches 2. All right, as x approaches 2, and I'm going to go ahead and make a notation here to indicate which side I'm coming from. As x approaches 2 from the left, minus sign meaning from the left, the negative direction. As I approach from the left, my outputs tend to be going to negative infinity. So f of x approaches negative infinity. And then as x approaches 2 from the right, as I come from the right, my outputs are going to positive infinity. I'm going to go ahead and put plus infinity there. All right, that indicates my vertical asymptote. I'm going to go ahead and make that note. All right, now my, for my end behavior, that is the horizontal asymptote. As I go, as my inputs increase, it looks like my outputs are actually approaching the value 4. Now, so that is an output of 4. That's what that indicates. Now, the same thing is happening. Let's go ahead and write the first one. As x goes to infinity, f of x approaches 4. But if you notice, as the x values increase, they approach 4 from above. Okay. And as you come go to negative infinity, those y values, those outputs, are also approaching 4, but they're just coming from underneath. So the way we want to write that is, as x approaches plus or minus infinity, f of x goes to 4. And that is the arrow notation. That is the arrow notation. And here's the way that is generally acceptable to write that as well. Two different notations there. All right, for our next example, we want to sketch a graph of the reciprocal function shifted two units to the left and up three. 
units. Identify horizontal and vertical asymptotes, if any. All right, well, the reciprocal function, the parent or toolkit function, appears like this with our horizontal and vertical asymptotes both at zero. So if we shift this to the left two units, that's going to shift our horizontal asymptote two units to the left. Right, so we'll have a horizontal asymptote there. And then shifting up three, we'll make our horizontal asymptote at positive three. And then based on the shape of that function, we should have behavior like so. Now that is a sketch, it's not perfect, but that about takes care of it. All right, so for our vertical asymptote, I want to write out what that end behavior looks like. That is it or that local behavior, that is at x equals negative 2. And that would be as x approaches negative 2 from the left, f of x approaches minus infinity. And as x approaches negative 2 from the right-hand side, the positive side, f of x is approaching positive infinity. And then we have our horizontal asymptote at y equals 3, obtained by shifting it up 3. And that is as x approaches plus or minus infinity, f of x approaches 4, or approaches 3 in this case. The last one was 4. All right, now this brings us to the definition of a rational function, Okay, how we define those. Now you'll notice that the examples we've looked at so far all fit, and those equations fit this definition. A rational function is a function that can be written as a quotient of two polynomials, p of x and q of x, so that our function is p of x divided by q of x, where q of x is not equal to zero. Okay, we still cannot divide by zero. That restriction will not change. Right, example three, a large mixing tank currently contains 100 gallons of water into which five pounds of sugar has been mixed. A tap will open pouring 10 gallons per minute of water into the tank. At the same time, sugar is poured, poured into the tank at a rate of one pound per minute. Find the concentration of sugar in the tank after 12 minutes. And then is this a greater concentration than at the beginning? So what we need to do is write a function. All right, we have concentration at time t. And we need to have some way to describe what is happening here. Well, the concentration is the amount of sugar divided by the amount of water, pounds per gallon. All right, well, initially there were five pounds of sugar. And that is changing at a rate of one pound per minute. All right, and the amount of water began at 100 gallons, and it is increasing at a rate of 10 gallons per minute. So there's my function that represents the concentration. That is the, the largest part of this. Now to find the concentration after 12 minutes, we want to find C of 12. So 5 plus 12 over 100 plus 10 times 12. All right. And that is going to be 17 divided by 120, 220. 17 divided by 220. Now to compare that to the concentration at the beginning, we need to find C of 0. C of 0 would be 5 plus 0 divided by 100 plus 10 times 0. So essentially, we're dealing with the 5 and the 100, which is 1 20th. All right, 1 20th is 0 0.05. OK, and 17 out of 220 is 0 0.07. So yes, yes, that is a greater concentration than at the beginning. 
Next, we want to find the domain of a rational function. Okay, how do we find domain restrictions? So set the denominator equal to zero, and then find the x values that cause the denominator to be zero. And then the, alt, the domain is all real numbers except those found in that step. So to find the domain of this function, f of x equals x plus three over x squared minus nine, we'll set our denominator equal to zero because we cannot have that equal to zero. All right, now, solving this, we could factor that. I'm gonna go ahead and say x squared equals nine. And if we take the square root, we get x equals plus or minus three. Remember, we are taking the square root there. So x equals plus or minus three will make our denominator zero. So that means our domain is x, x's that are not equal to plus or minus three written in interval notation, that would be negative infinity to minus three. Okay, not including that value, then picking up where we left off from minus three to three, S not including that, picking up where we left off and going to positive infinity. And that would be our domain written in two different places. All right, now, there are actually two types of domain restrictions here. One, well, they're still going to classify as domain restrictions, but there's a something called a hole, okay? A hole, a removable discontinuity is what that's called, and there's a vertical asymptote, which we've already seen, and we'll see how these actually classify in a moment from another example. So to find the vertical asymptotes, okay, we have a little flow chart help us with that. Given a rational function, identify any vertical asymptotes on the graph, of its graph. Okay, factor the numerator and denominator, note restrictions in domain, then we want to reduce the expression by canceling common factors. Now, any values that actually cancel, okay, those restrictions where the asymptotes don't occur, where the factors cancel, those are removable discontinuities or holes. Values that make the denominator, cause the denominator to be zero in the simplified version, those are the vertical asymptotes. All right, so let's go through these steps with this function. k of x equals five plus two x squared divided by two minus x minus x squared. All right, well, it looks like the numerator does not factor, however, our denominator does, two, five plus two x squared. All right, that will factor as two plus x times one minus x. Now the values that make our denominator zero, now if you notice we cannot apply step three, we can't simplify this, we can't reduce it. All right, so we've got two values here x cannot be negative two, nor can x be one. And because neither of those terms canceled, we have a vertical asymptote at x equals minus two and x equals one. We can in fact have two of those. Since neither of those factors canceled, again, we do not have removable discontinuities. A removable discontinuity occurs in the graph if a is a zero for the factor of the, num of the denominator that's common with a factor of the denominator. Effectively, the factors that cancel, if it's a factor that cancels, then it's going to be a removable discontinuity. All right, so I'm going to sort of skim over that, and let's consider this example. Find the vertical asymptotes and removable discontinuities of this graph. K of x equals x minus two over x squared minus four. Right, so we can factor this as x minus two, and then that factors as x minus two, or plus two, x minus two. Now we have two domain restrictions. X is not equal to minus two or positive two. Notice that before we reduce anything, that is extremely important. Now, if we reduce these two factors, because that factor canceled, 
x equals 2, x equals 2 is a removable discontinuity. Continuity. Because that factor canceled, which that leaves this value at being our vertical asymptote. Right, so we'll state this as we have a vertical asymptote of x equals negative 4 and a hole or a removable discontinuity at x equals 2. That will sum up what we have there. Next, how do we find horizontal asymptotes? We know how algebraically to find to find vertical asymptotes and removable discontinuities, but for horizontal asymptotes we have three cases. Horizontal asymptotes of rational functions can be determined by looking at the degrees of the numerator and the denominator. If the degree of the numerator or the denominator is greater than the degree of the numerator, denominator greater than numerator, horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. That's the easiest case there. If the denominator degree is less than the degree of the numerator, then there is no horizontal asymptote, but there is a, something called a slant asymptote that we will explore. And then if the degree of the denominator equals the numerator's degree, then the horizontal asymptote is at the ratio of the leading coefficients. Alright, now there's only actually one example in our textbook, but I've actually left two of them in here because we could use some practice with this. So I'm going to go ahead and write this here. Degree of the numerator. Okay. okay. Oh, that's stated as denominator first, though. The degree of the denominator, if that's greater than the numerator, then we have an asymptote at y equals zero. All right. If the degree of the denominator is less than the degree of the numerator, slant, and in that case we'll have to do some division. If the degree of the denominator is equal to the degree of the numerator, okay, then it's the ratio of leading coefficients. Ratio of those leading coefficients is how we'll find that. All right, for example seven, find the horizontal asymptotes of these three functions. All right. Well, if you notice, the degree here, let's go ahead and label that, the degree is, let's not say equal, the degree is 1, it's 4x plus 2. The denominator, the degree is 2. Since the denominator is greater than the numerator, we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. All right, moving on. Example B, part B. The degree of the, de of the numerator is 2. The degree of the denominator is 1. The denominator is, or the denominator is less than the numerator, so there's a slant asymptote. So we're going to need to divide here. And I'm going to go ahead and divide with, with our synthetic division. So that'll be 3 minus 2, 1. 1 times 3 is 3, negative 2 and 3 is 1, 1 times 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. So our division results in 3x plus 1 plus 2 divided by x minus 1. Okay, so this means we have a slant asymptote. at y equals 3x plus 1. That is the quotient of that division. Right, and then part c, the degree of the numerator is 2. The degree of the denominator is also 2. They're equal, so we take the ratio of the leading coefficients. So that means we take the ratio of 3, and in this case 1, 
So we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 3. And I'll go ahead and write that's 3 over 1 or 3. Now we'll do the same thing for these. The degree of the numerator is 3, the degree of the denominator is 3. The degrees are equal, so we will have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 6 over 2, or y equals 3. Part B, degree of the numerator is 2, degree of the denominator is 1. Because the denominator is less than the numerator, we will do some division, so this will be negative 2 to find our slant asymptote. 1 minus 4, 1. Bring down the 1, negative 2 times 1 is minus 2. Negative 4 minus 2 is minus 6. Negative 2 times negative 6 is positive 12, and then that is 13. So we have a slant asymptote at y equals x minus 6, because this is x minus 6, 1x minus 6 plus 13 over x plus 2. And then our last one, the degree of the numerator is 2, the x squared, the highest exponent, and the degree of the denominator is 3. Because the denominator is greater, we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. All right. For our next question, we want to return to our sugar concentration problem and find the horizontal asymptote and interpret it. Well, because the degree of the numerator is 1 and the degree of the denominator is also 1, we'll take our coefficient 1 divided by 10. So we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1 tenth, which means in the long run, I'm just going to go ahead and say this. In the long run, there will be a concentration of one-tenth one -tenth of a gallon per, or pound per gallon worth of units there. Okay, and that is as x, or t, as t goes to infinity. As time increases, we're eventually going to have one-tenth, or very close to one-tenth of a gallon, or pound per gallon, as a concentration. All right, next function we want to find horizontal and vertical asymptotes of is written in factored form. Right. So what we need to do is consider what the degree would be if we multiplied it out. In this case, we have two degrees of one factors. Okay. So when we multiply those two, we would get a degree of two. In the denominator, we would get a degree of three. So we have a horizontal asymptote okay, of y equals zero. And if we were going to find the horizontal asymptote, or vertical asymptote, Okay. That would be at x equals, these are the values that make the denominator 0, x equals 1, minus 2, and positive 5. Now I know that none of those are removable discontinuities because none of the factors would simplify. All right. So there are my horizontal and vertical asymptotes. Now for that same function, let's find the intercepts. Let's find the intercepts. All right, so these would be, for the y-intercept, I'll be finding f of 0. And finding f of 0 would be 0 minus 2, so that's minus 2 times 3, we have minus 1 times 2 times minus 5. And that is negative 6 over positive 10, or minus 3 fifths. So that is the point 0 minus 3 
fifths. Now for x intercepts, we want to know where the numerator is going to be zero. x minus two times x plus three, where that is zero. Similar to how we found the vertical asymptotes in the last question, that is at x equals two and at x equals minus three. So we have x intercepts of two zero and minus three zero. Now this brings us to finding the graph, graphing a rational function. We want to go in this order. First, y-intercept, factor, find the factors that are not common, and those are going to tell us the x-intercepts. Okay, we look at our numerator. Then we look at the multiplicities of the x-intercepts to determine the behavior. Okay, just like with polynomials, whether it's linear or quadratic behavior, bouncing or crossing, or touching or crossing are the two that we go with. Then we look at the multiplicities of zeros to determine local behavior. Okay, and that is for our denominator. That tells us whether it's going to act like the reciprocal or the reciprocal squared. We find removable discontinuities by seeing what cancels. Then we find the horizontal asymptotes and slant asymptotes and then sketch. All right, so let's see what we can do for this next function. Sketch the graph of f of x equals x plus 2 times x minus 3, and we have x plus 1 squared over, and then we have also have an x minus 2 term there. All right, so first we'll go ahead and find our y-intercept. So evaluating this at 0, that'll be 0 plus 2, so we'll go ahead and say that's 2 times minus three, we have one squared, and then we have minus two. So that's minus six over minus two. So our y-intercept is zero, three. Next we'll move on to x-intercepts. That would set x plus two times x minus three equal to zero which makes x be minus two or positive three. So our x-intercepts are minus two, zero, and three, zero. Now each of those, each of these factors up here have a single multiplicity. So we have multiplicity equals one which means that these are going to cross at those places rather than touch. Right, now let's look at our vertical asymptotes. It doesn't look like any expressions can't any factors cancel so there are no there are no removable discontinuities. Vertical asymptotes will occur when the denominator is 0, so x plus 1 squared x minus 2. So we have x equals minus 1 and positive 2. Now looking at the multiplicities here, multiplicity of 2, okay, multiplicity of 2 tells us that this is going to act like at that point, locally, it's going to look like the reciprocal squared function. So we're going to have something that looks like this, or something that looks like this. Now this one, multiplicity of 1, means we're going to have at that point something, our asymptote will look something like that. Right, that, I believe, tells us almost everything we need to know. Our horizontal asymptote, the degree of the denominator is 3, and the numerator is 2, so this is going to be y equals 0. So let's sketch this graph. First, we'll start with our y-intercept of 3. Right. Y-intercept of 3, we have x-intercepts at negative 2 
and at three. Put those points there. And we know it's going to cross at those points. Let's see, we will have a vertical asymptote at minus one and two. Oh, I missed my point there. Minus one and at two. All right, now we know both of those are going to cross. We don't know which way they're going to go. Okay, so for the point zero, zero, okay. Okay, so with each of those two points, we know that we are going to have something like this occurring at x equals negative one. So it's either going to increase here and increase here or decrease here and decrease here. But we know there's no x-intercepts in between here. So this function must increase. Now because of the x minus one squared that we had, this function must also, it's going to act like the reciprocal squared and it's going to cross, so it's going to come down this way. Okay, and I'm going to have to modify that in a second. Now the other is going to act like the one over x, so it's going to go in the opposite direction. So this function must come down here and it crosses. Let's scratch that because I haven't taken into account the horizontal asymptote yet. It has to approach zero. So this function must do something like this and come back and approach y equals zero. There's a lot of pieces there, so make sure that you understand each one and go back and listen to this again if you'd like. Our, our last question is write the equation for this rational function. For this function, we're going in the opposite direction. All right, so we know that we need to have an equation with a y-intercept of minus two, so zero minus two. We know that we need to have x-intercepts at the point negative two, zero, and three, zero. And we're going to have multiplicities of one there because they cross. So you have one from each of those. All right, we can see that we have vertical asymptote, asymptotes at x equals, did I label that properly up here? Yes, I did. All right, vertical asymptotes at minus one and at positive two. It appears to look like the reciprocal squared here, so this is gonna have multiplicity two. and it appears to look like, or sorry, scratch that, that's the other one. Multiplicity of one there because these are going in opposite directions. Here at x equals two, they're going in the same direction, so that indicates multiplicity of two. All right, now let's begin to piece a function together y equals a, we don't know what the constant factor is going to be there. Because of those x-intercepts, we have x minus three and x plus two with multiplicities of one. The denominator, we have an x plus one squared, no, just x plus one, and an x minus two will be squared because of that behavior. That pieces it together. We just need to find the value of a. So pick a point that we have not used so far. Actually, we could use the y-intercept. We haven't used that yet. So let's use the point zero minus two. Our output is minus two. When our input is zero, so that would be minus three times two over one, and that is minus two squared. So that will be minus six over 4, 
So minus 3 over 2a equals minus 2, which indicates that a must be equal to 4 over 3. So our function, I'm going to go ahead and write that in function notation, is 4 thirds, we'll have our fraction here, x minus 3, x plus 2, again with our single multiplicities, x plus 1 with a single multiplicity, x minus 2, squared. Okay, and that brings us to the end of this section. Now, there are lots of moving parts here, so again, go back and particularly you might want to check out the last two questions um, more intently than the rest because they have all of those pieces working together, but go back and look at those individual questions if you have issues with horizontal asymptotes, vertical asymptotes, removal discontinuities. Look at an example with only one of those in it if that helps.